Thank you, Brother Amador. That's a good song. I see Doug brought me another another cup of water so I could spill it. All right. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2. It's kind of a little flock tonight. But I'm glad you're here. God has something for you. I have no doubt about that. <clears throat> I talked to Tim Habman the other day. He um, just called me to <laughs> wish me a happy Father's Day. I got a call this morning from David Bosley calling and wish me, wishing me a happy Father's Day. And I got a call day before yesterday from Jack Cox in Laporte, Indiana, just to say hi and said he's praying for me. But what really hurt me is um, a buddy of mine who's 80-something years old called to say Happy Father's Day. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if he loves me or is confused. But it's an old buddy of mine. It was good to hear from him. Tim Habman, uh, he said that... Uh, we just had our fifth girl. I said, looks like the Havman clan is in real trouble. Pretty soon there won't be any Havmans. You got to have some boys. And uh, to perpetuate that name. D.L. Moody is credited with saying, I would rather win ten soul winners, I'd rather train ten soul winners than win ten souls. And uh, certainly his legacy lives on because he practiced exactly what he preached and what he believed. And that was that if the ministry is to be perpetuated and continued, pastors and missionaries must train young men and women to be pastors and missionaries. And it's not enough to just train men to be men, uh, pastors and missionaries, but we are to train men who are able to train men. You understand that? If you put all your efforts in a person who does not have the ability to train anyone else, your efforts die with that person. So we thank God for every person in the ministry, every person who serves Jesus Christ, of course. But it is best if you invest your life into somebody who can invest their life into somebody else. And there are certain qualities as well as uh, skills and uh, things that are needed in order to do that. I want you to look at chapter 2 with me. And look at uh, verse 2 of uh, 2 Timothy. The things that thou hast heard of me, that is of me, Paul, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we um, certainly need your help. We can do nothing that is of any value by ourselves. I pray you'll help us to be able to identify and invest ourselves into men and women of character, into men and women of commitment, and uh, that the cause of Christ might continue. Thank you for those who've invested in us and help us to honor you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And so in this uh, chapter, there are, in Second Timothy, he talks about the kind of men that God wants to use. And um, down in verse 7, um, 
he tells him to consider what I say and the Lord give thee understanding. And God is looking for fearless men. You cannot be timid. You cannot be uh, afraid. If you're going to do the ministry, if you're going to be a missionary. Now you may be afraid, I guess. Fear is okay, but you can't let it stop you. And uh, so you have to, uh, you have to be a, if you're not willing to take the heat, you have to stay out of the kitchen. Leadership always carries responsibility. You cannot blame your people for failure and take the credit for success. And, um, and so um, if, you, uh, if you're afraid of men, afraid to speak the Word of God, afraid to deal with issues, you won't do well in the ministry. Nobody likes to. I don't like to deal with problems. But they have to be dealt with. Um, that's why many folks, they're permissive with their children. They just let their children do anything they want to do uh, because uh, the parent's afraid that, you know, uh, my kid won't be my buddy anymore. Well, you have to be a father first and then a buddy second. And uh, so you have to be fearless. And God is looking for some men. By the way, in that film there with the the Yananami Indians and so on. And I've been in that village and I was there before any of those people were converted. In fact, uh, one of the missionaries we support uh, spent 17 years down there learning the language and, uh, and working with those people. When they found them, there was no language on the earth similar to the language of the Yananami Indians. So they had to, uh, new tribes had to go in and rather than teach them English, they lived with the Indians and learned their language. Then they created an alphabet after learning their language and then began to translate. And while I was there, they were translating the scriptures into their language. So it took 17 years before they had any converts in that tribe. That's a long time. But somebody has to lay a foundation and there has to be a foundation and language, there has to be a language and there has to be an alphabet and there has to be writing before you can communicate uh, the Bible and put the Bible in their hands. And, and now the new uh, president down there, he's, uh, he's demanding that all of the missionaries leave. And so we need to pray for these Indians who are saved that they will become missionaries to the other tribes. That is God's plan. And, uh, and then you have to be strong in the Lord. You don't have to be physically strong. If you're sickly, you'll have some problems. But you need to be strong uh, in what you believe and, uh, and the way you believe God wants you to go. And then you have to love men. You have to, you have to love people. And you have to love men uh, in the ministry. And I don't mean that you have to, but... You do have to. <laughs> and if you're right with God, you will. In fact, that's what Brother Tim was telling me, that he says, you know, I'm learning to love my people. I said, well, maybe they're learning to love you too. You better hope they do. And of course, a man has to be sound in doctrine. You can't be blown about by every wind of doctrine. You have to know what you believe. There are many areas out there that we don't have the answers to. It's best to stay out of those waters until you get the answers. You know, swim in familiar waters. You know what I mean? And in those areas where that, uh, you know, there's some things in the Bible that, that um, it's hard to understand them. Especially you get into the book of Ezekiel and look at those symbols and those types and wheel within wheels and all that kind of stuff. I have no idea what that stuff means. I've never preached a sermon out of Ezekiel other than prophecy in chapter 38 and 39, I believe. But I just stay out of that stuff because I don't understand it. And, uh, and so, uh, but you have to be sound in the faith. Now Paul here in chapter 2, verse 2, he gives a charge or a command to Timothy. And he tells uh, Timothy to teach others what, uh, 
what he himself had taught Timothy. He said, what you've learned and heard about me and seen in me, he said, that teach to somebody else. Who will be able to teach somebody else? And, uh, and so that is something we have to keep in mind when we are discipling people. You do not want to invest all of your life in somebody that is not going to invest their life in somebody else. You take them, you help them, you go so far with them. But if it's, if it's obvious that these people are not faithful or do not have the ability, you still are their pastor, you still are their friend, but you don't spend personal time investing it in them. You look for men and women who are committed, as he says in this text, and are able and uh, so the charge here is that the Lord's uh, church is to propagate itself. If it doesn't, there won't be any churches. And a church ought to start churches. They ought to start churches locally within the state and the community, but they are, and as well as around the world. And uh, I think the more churches a church can establish, the greater, the more it is doing the the work of God and the Great Commission. And uh, so um, these things were to be taught to others. And there's to be a continuous cycle of learning. There was a pastor in Soap Lake. His name was Dave Douglas. When I was in my early 20s in that little church in Soap Lake, uh, he started a Bible study uh, up in the attic of, of the church. It just, you know, you just barely, you, had, you could stand up in the center of the attic, but you got over to the side, the, you know, the sloping roof, and you had to begin to stoop down. And there was myself and Leroy Friend and Lanny Schrag and, and one other person. There was four men. And we'd be up there on a Monday night, or maybe, I don't remember what night, but I think it was a Monday night or a Sunday night. And uh, he had... Um, I think it was Bancroft's Systematic Theology. <laughs> and uh, he was teaching us Bible doctrine, the four of us men. And uh, I'll never forget that. And I'd never been to Bible college. I was still working for Boeing. But here is a man that had graduated from Johnson City, New York, Bible college there. And he was trying to invest himself in men that he thought and hoped would do something for God. Now, I don't know what happened to Lanny Schrag or the fourth guy, but I can tell you that Leroy Friend in Soap Lake is still serving God. In fact, he'll be here for our uh, final service, and Lord willing, on October uh, 1st, or September 1st, I hope. Um, but uh, he'll be here then. And, of course, I have tried to take some of the things that these men have instilled in me and taught me and tried to teach them to you and others. But there's to be a continuous cycle. And when that cycle stops, it's all over. It's done. And I do not want the cause of Christ to die with me. I would like to be able to leave behind some men and women who are serving the Lord because of my efforts. Wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you like to have somebody in the ministry because of you? And you could have. You could have. All you got to do is just invest your life and get with it. You know, you say, well, I don't have, a, you, I don't even want to hear your alibis. See, because none of them will fly. And so uh, this is a, you know, this is an old method, but it works if the right kind of men are found. Now, of course, you've got, you've got to have the right kind of, right kind of men. And, uh, Here's the kind of men he needs. He needs faithful men. Notice what it says. And they have to be faithful to the Lord. In verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard among me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. So you ought to underline that word or circle that word faithful. Uh, the Lord himself was faithful. He was, uh, God is faithful. He's a faithful creator. And uh, God never lets you down. You can always depend on Him. That's what faithfulness is. And uh, so uh, you have to find faithful men, men who love church, men who love the Bible, 
men who love serving the Lord and serving others. Moses was faithful. It says in Hebrews, he was faithful in all of his house. So he was a faithful servant. Paul was faithful. He said, I thank God that he counted me faithful putting me in the ministry. And so uh, faithfulness is is a, is, a, you know, is a prerequisite for ministry. And uh, men whom the Lord uh, is going to use, he, it must be men he can trust. Paul said that he, in, he trusted me, he entrusted me with the gospel. And uh, if God puts you in the ministry, he's trusting you with it. He's made you a steward of it, no matter what your ministry is. And uh, you and I are to be faithful in that. He's put a Bible in your hand. He's put the Holy Spirit in you. You're, you're the custodian of the Holy Spirit. You're the keeper of the Holy Spirit. He's in you if you're, a say, if you're a believer. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you the Gospel. And uh, you and I are to be ambassadors of that. But God is looking for faithful people, people He can depend on. You know, I found out over the years that there are people you can depend on and there's people to be faithful and there's people you can depend on to not be faithful. And uh, they have to be faithful not only to the Lord, they have to be faithful to the Word of God. It, it, they have to hold fast. Look at chapter 1 and verse 13. Hold fast, he said, the form or pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. He says, you hold on to that pattern that, uh, of those sound words, to the example. That's what a pattern is. Uh, it looks like the real thing, but it's a pattern. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a blueprint or something you follow. And he said, I want you to hold fast to that. Look at chapter 3 and verse 14 of the same book. Um, he said that, uh, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So a man and a woman must be faithful to the Word of God. And uh, if they preach the truth, you have to practice it. If you preach that men ought to tithe, you ought to tithe. If you preach people, people ought to read their Bible, you ought to read your Bible. You preach people ought to win souls, you ought to be a soul winner. You shouldn't preach anything you're not willing to be. And um, so um, we have to be faithful to the Lord and faithful to the Word. We need to be faithful to the church. The church, I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about God's people. And uh, we're to serve the brethren, we're to serve them, that's what we're here for. That's what leadership is. It is servant. You, serve, you lead by serving. Now, I don't mean that serving is tying somebody's shoe, though it's okay if that's necessary. Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and he left a pattern of humility and service. But in church, there are no big shots. Nobody. There's nobody above somebody else. It is, it's, it's called service. And you have to be willing to serve people. And uh, that a, a, these leaders are, in fact, the Lord himself said that the, if you want to be great, be the servant of everybody. He said serve. Get in the ministry and learn how to serve. And uh, some folks think serving means that you do everything for them. But that is exactly contrary to what verse 2 says in our chapter. It's not doing everything for them. It's teaching them how to do it. That is how you serve people. That's how you bring the best out in people. That's how you build self-esteem in people is you let them learn how to do what they ought to do. And then when you're out of the picture, they can still go on. Someone said, if you give a man a fish, you feed him one meal. You teach him how to fish, he can feed himself forever. So the same thing is true in the Christian life. You, you have to teach people how to fish. You have to show them how to bait the hook. But you don't do it for them forever or you cripple them. 
Could you imagine Jason with his boy when his boy is 20 years old and he's still putting the bait on the hook for him? Well, he'd be handicapping the boy. See? Even right now, he's got Mary teaching him how to do it. <laughs> but you understand my story. You show him, you help him, you teach him now that he's a boy, he's young, he's a kid. But when he's a man, you don't do that for him. And uh, if you do everything for people, you handicap them. Not only that, you, you, know, you, you send the wrong message. And uh, so God is looking for faithful men and women. Faithfulness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And here's the thing about faithfulness, folks, is nobody can be more faithful than you. Nobody has a corner on faithfulness. You know, people can sing better than you, but they can't be more faithful. People may be able to preach better than you, but they can't be more faithful. They may be able to give more money than you, but they can't, they can't be any more faithful than you. And uh, so it doesn't matter what your abilities are, you can be faithful. And then there's a need for teachable men. Look at the text again, verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. But notice the next part of it, it says, who shall be able. Now you can't blame a person if they're not able. If a man is unable, then he's just unable, he can't do it. And uh, there may be a few people, but it, a man is not called to the ministry if he cannot teach other people. Because the ministry is a teaching ministry. And it is a developing ministry. You must develop people. Otherwise, uh, once again, you know, uh, it dies with you. Moses died and there was Joshua. And, you know, Paul, uh, Jesus spent time with the twelve. And we don't know much about the seventy, but he had these men. And here's the thing. Uh, in private ministry, the Lord preached to thousands. I'm sorry, in public ministry, he preached to thousands. But in private ministry, he trained a few. And that's what a, a preacher and a missionary uh, needs to learn. In your public ministry, you preach to as many as God will give you. But in your private ministry, you're training a few faithful men and women. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He says you need to find people who are not only committed, not only love the Lord. You know, let me uh, look around and I want to say something here. Because well, the last thing in the world I'd ever want to do is embarrass the guy. Uh, you know Brother Tom Bodette? Now, Tom Bodette probably loves the Lord as much as anybody I know. I think he does. I may be wrong, but I believe he does. Uh, he's about as faithful as anybody I know. In fact, I'm surprised he's not here tonight. But he's not able to do what needs to be done in the area I'm speaking of. Does that make sense to you? He's faithful, but he's not capable. And I don't fault him for that, not one bit. I love him. In fact, I suspect at the judgment seat he'll be at the head of the line. I really do. Because you and I, you know, I guess, <laughs> maybe, maybe we have more abilities. And to whom much is given, much is required. But, but there are some people that, who are good people and they love God. But they just don't have the, the aptitude or they don't have the skills that are needed in the area that Paul is speaking of. And so they need to be teachable. Some people you can't teach them. They, uh, they're just, they aren't teachable. And it's not because they have any kind of a mental deficiency. It's just, you know, they, they have a closed mind. Uh, they've learned it all. And they can't hear you when you talk to them. And unless men are willing to be taught, God's method won't work. And I believe this. I, I, I tell Brother Murphy this, and, and I believe it. 
I believe when you stop learning, you stop leading. When you stop learning, you stop leading. And so it's always a learning process, and unless men are willing to be taught God's methods, it won't work. Timothy himself provided a good example because uh, he, um, you know, he was taught by his mother and his grandmother. Look at chapter 1 and uh, down about verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother and then in your mother. And so he was, he was, he was influenced there as a young man. And you've heard me say, you know, my, my faith was first in my grandfather and grandmother and then in my mother and now in me. And I hope that my faith is in some of my children and some of my grandchildren. Because I don't want this thing to die out with the first or second generation. I'd like for it to go on for the cause of Christ. And so uh, he was, you know, he was from a child, he was willing to learn. He was willing to go with Paul when Paul went on mission trips. And uh, he was willing to, to study and, and then to teach. And Paul had told him, as a preacher, uh, he, he must study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's written to pastors. And certainly written to Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So he has to be taught by example and also by scripture. And a good way uh, to learn is to work with somebody who's doing something. Because we learn by watching. And let people do things. You know, it's okay to let people fail as long as it's not, they're not falling in the Grand Canyon. You know, that happens. You can't recover and help them. But, you know, it's okay to let people fail. Sometimes people have to fail before they realize they need any help. If you follow the Lord's ministry, you'll see He let the disciples fail many times. Then they'll come back and say, why couldn't we cast Him out? And the Lord said, well, you've got to pray. <laughs> you need to pray. That's why. And constantly they were needing correction and instruction from the Lord, but He was training them, preparing them for His ministry after He went back to heaven. And so they had to be willing, these uh, men who are going to have the ministry committed to them, uh, they have to be uh, willing to be taught by others and they have to be willing to teach themselves. You need to be taught by others and self-taught as well. And uh, so you have to take advantage of every opportunity to learn, whether it be at the feet of somebody else or the private of your own study or whatever it is, but you ought to constantly be learning how to do a better job for the Lord Jesus Christ as a teacher, as a leader, whatever it is. Uh, God needs teaching men. Um, you'll notice it says in the same verse, who shall be able to teach others also. And the reason for that is because that's what God needs. And uh, we not only teach the Bible to other men and women, but we need to teach them how to do ministry. The Lord, uh, I know men that, that uh, and they're good men, and they know the Bible forward and backward. But, or they're good soul winners, but they don't know how to train men. You look at some great men, if you compare D.L. Moody to DeWitt Talmadge or someone of that nature, D.L. Moody did the right thing. Talmadge was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived in America. I've got his 500 sermons, every one of them. I mean, they're a masterpiece. He was such a brilliant orator. And, uh, and understood almost everything. He could take a snail on the beach and build a sermon on it. I mean, really, he would study and find out about it, and, and he was a brilliant man. 
but you don't have any legacy. D.L. Moody, I've never heard that he was that great a preacher. He was just average. You read his sermons. There's nothing spectacular in them. But he built great institutions and trained men and women to be teachers and missionaries. And Moody Bible Institute exists today and is still sending out missionaries around the world. You understand what I'm saying? They're both great men. My pastor, Tom Malone, was a, was a great preacher, one of the greatest pulpiteers I've ever heard, maybe alongside Jack Hiles. And, uh, but he was not gifted at developing men. He hired pastors in the area to teach his Bible college. And I'm so thank, I thank God I was able to sit under the ministry of, of Dr. Paul Vanneman, who not only was a good friend, a great preacher, but uh, he understood the ministry. Tom Malone, uh, he... Um, he, he just did not invest himself and take time. You know, I hope you understand, I, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody. When I'm gone, just go after me. I don't care. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm just trying to, trying to help, help you with something here. Tom Malone was a great preacher. He had over 50 years, 50-something 50 years of pastoral ministry. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know. I'm sure he's forgotten it because he's in heaven now. <laughs> he's dead. But uh, when Joyce and I, Mrs. Blue and I went to Bible college, they probably had 2,500 to 3,000 in church. Large number of those were, were students. Um, I think there was three to 500 students there when I went. And, uh, and I loved it. I loved Midwestern Baptist College and Emmanuel Baptist Church. I loved being there. And um, the, 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 I graduated. And Dr. Vanneman was, uh, you know, he was uh, always picking. You know, he's always a clown. Not always, but most of the time. But, uh, you know, he handed me my diploma. And, uh, you know, I'm just as proud as a pig in a parlor. I mean, I'll tell you what, this is the greatest accomplishment of my life. I got a diploma. Yeah, I got a piece of paper that said you did the work. And, um, and after I went on, started across the stage, Dr. Vanneman patted me on the back and said, Go get them, Ken. He saw a little bit in me. And, um, but let me tell you something. In 38 years of ministry here at Open Door Baptist Church, Dr. Malone, the president of the college, called me one time and that was when he saw that we had advertised in the sword of the Lord and promoted the college and he called me to thank me. You do not build a following like that. God loved Tom Malone. I'm not mad at him. I'm just saying. You know what he should have been doing? He should have been on the phone every six months or less calling every graduate from that college and said, how are you doing, Brother Ken? I want you to know I'm really glad you came to our college and we pray for you every day. You know what I would have been doing for the last 30-something years? I would have been shuffling students down there. But he just was not a builder in that he built, invested his life into people. He was a great preacher, one of the finest. In fact, uh, Julian Lyons, a guy that worked for him in, in Midwest, has almost all of his sermons on reel-to-reel -reel tape. And I'm going to see what I can do if I can find an old reel-to-reel -reel core tape recorder. And I want to have those put on CD. So if any of you have got an old tape recorder reel to reel that works uh, I would you know I wish you'd let me know and um, but you know I'm just the man was strong in preaching like Talmadge 
but weak and personal investment in the individual. Discipleship is not preaching. Discipling people is not teaching a class. Discipling is working with people. You have to be with them. You take a bus and you go to Port Orchard, you take some young men with you. You take a bus and go to a meeting in Tacoma or Portland, you take some young men with you and let them be with you. And so uh, you're looking for people who will teach others also because uh, others have to be taught. They have to be taught. And unless men and women are willing to teach other, God's methods won't work. I've already said that. And Timothy, he provided, certainly he provided a good example. You know, I think there's probably three major things that a person must have, probably in any business, but as well as in ministry. There are three things. Um, you have to have the right personality, and I don't know what that is, but you have to have it. Um... Bill Clinton has personality. So does Obama. I mean, those guys are smoother than butter. Uh, really, they're personality plus. Uh, I'll tell you a guy who's not personality is George Bush. You know, I think he's a good president. I think he's a good man. I just blame him for the rain up here because I know it's his fault. But I think he tries to be a good man in spite of the fact that he calls global warming and all of that. <laughs> but, 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 he, but, you know, I, you're almost embarrassed when he gets up to speak. But he's a good president. He's just not a good speaker. Adolf Hitler was an excellent speaker. <laughs> he was. He could captivate thousands of people with his speech and with his Gestapo. Kind of held them in check. But you're going to have to have, there, has, there is a personality that has to be able to relate to other people. There are people in a church that are not bad people. They're just not your cup of tea. You, you know what I mean? Sure you do. You do that at college. There, there are certain people that you kind of blend with, the chemistry's right, the personality's right, and you get along well. There are other people, they're not bad people, but they're just kind of, it's, it's the turning the magnet around and repels. And so personality is important, but it's not the most important thing. And then there's aptitude. That's the ability to learn to do the job. You have to learn how to do the work that you're called to do and the more you learn and the more you work at it, the better you should become. That's called aptitude. You have to have some aptitude for whatever vocation that you're going to take. And the same thing is true in the ministry. A man in the ministry must be apt to teach, the Bible says. He has to be able to do it. He has to be able to rightly divide the Bible. He has to convince the gainsayers. You have to be able to convince people. I mean, if you're a salesman and you can never convince a customer, you're not much of a salesman. Right? I mean, you know, but, but I talk to a lot of people. I don't care how many you talk to. Where are the customers? Where are the sales? Where's the bottom line? And the same thing is true in the ministry. You have to be able to close the deal and get people saved and get them to join your church and get them to live for God. That's your, that's your calling. That's what you're called to do. And you have to have some aptitude for that. But most, most importantly is your character. You have to have good character. And if people don't have respect for your character, you're done. It doesn't matter your personality. Bill Clinton has great personality. I have no respect for his character. You understand? Most Hollywood people, I mean, they've got personality oozing out of them. But I wouldn't trust them with my dog. You understand? They don't have any character. And so the most important thing that you can have is your character. 
Because if that gets tarnished, you can't get it back. Or it takes a long time. And that's why Paul told Timothy, he said, If you pay attention to these things I'm telling you, and give yourself wholly to them, he said, you'll save yourself first, and then those who hear you. And so we have to be willing to teach other men, and willing to teach according to their abilities. Not everybody has the same ability. I don't have the ability of many, many pastors. I have more, I have more ability than some pastors, by the grace of God. But there are many pastors that have more ability to do the work than I do. And uh, they reach more people, personality-wise, and, and aptitude, and so on. And, uh, and, and you don't need to be in competition with others, but you need to be your best self. And you need to be willing to teach your people according to their abilities. Not everyone serves as a teacher in the formal sense. There are some people in church that, you know, they're Sunday school teachers. They're not called to pastor, but, God, but they are able to teach and thank God for them. And as I've said, men have different abilities. And uh, I didn't plan to go there, but let's do that and I'll be through. Let's go to the book of Romans and uh, it's a chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we're talking about uh, God-given abilities. Look down about Romans 12, verse 3. Paul says, For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, and the thing you have to watch if you're successful is you have to watch pride. More people have fallen because of pride than because of anything else. And you have to watch success. That's why the Lord said not to put a novice in the ministry, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. And so he says, for the men that are among you, uh, not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Don't be intoxicated if you have any gifts. They're all gifts anyway. God gave them to you. So you don't have anything that wasn't given to you. It's like the flea on the elephant's back saying, we really shook the bridge, didn't we? And uh, so, uh, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so uh, a fellow needs to prove his ministry, verse 2. Look what it says. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is for your life. And so that's what it means is to, uh, to be able to uh, prove to yourself what God has enabled you to do. Verse 4 of uh, chapter 12. For as the body, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are, in a, in are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, that's preaching, let us uh, do according to our faith. Our ministry... That's doing the work of the ministry, which is not just preaching. Let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, or he that giveth, talking about finances, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, <coughs> that's the administrative end there, talking about uh, administrators. Um, and he says, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful or lazy in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And so uh, these are some of the, uh, the gifts 
that the preacher will not only have himself, but he will see the, these in other people within the church. And, uh, and uh, all of these need to be developed. All right? So for the gospel to spread and grow, God needs the right kind of men. And he has to have faithful men that he can depend on. And he has to have men and women who are teachable, who are not closed-minded or they know it all. And then they have to have men who will teach. That is, men willing to serve the Lord by teaching others. And uh, so this is... Uh, probably one of the key verses in the ministry for the minister. The things which thou hast heard of many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I agree with D.L. Moody when he said, I would rather train ten soul winners than personally to win ten souls. And common sense explains the importance of that. If you are just one person, you may go out and win ten souls. But if you could train ten soul winners to go out and win ten, you'd have a hundred people saved. You see how it works? And so I think that a, a man ought to have his sight set on developing young men and women, looking for those who have the commitment and the aptitude to serve the Lord, develop them, work with them, <laughs> and train them, and then send them off either to the mission field or to start another church somewhere, so that the purpose of the church perpetuates itself. Does that make sense to you?